okay um welcome to the third session of virtual seminar series on hemoglobinopathies today we have an eminent clinical clinician scientist professor martin steinberg from boston university school of medicine thank you so much professor steinberg for accepting our invitation and it's a great honor for us to have you at our seminar series today's session will be chaired by dr chandak dr chandak is a chief scientist and group leader at center for cellular and molecular biology at hyderabad uh, professor chandak thanks dr shiva for uh, having me on this interesting series on hemoglobinopathies uh, welcome professor martin uh, it's my really proud privilege to introduce you sir uh, i know you as a hematologist and your clinical and research focus has been on disorders of red blood cell with special emphasis on sickle cell anemia and hemoglobinopathies So, Professor Martin is a graduate of Cornell University and Tufts University School of Medicine. He completed his postgraduate training in New York and Boston, and currently he is a professor at the Boston University School of Medicine. Professor Martin is also associated with uh, various centers. One of them being Center of Excellence on Sickle Cell Disease. He also is a member of the faculty. the center for regenerative medicine at the same place professor martin is a very prolific publisher he has published close to 450 articles and three textbooks all related to the science and clinical features of sickle cell disease and related disorders he has largely focused on his work on fetal hemoglobin he has been instrumental in identifying various cis and trans acting elements that explain the high fetal hemoglobin levels in saudi patients as a part of arab indian haplotype and he has done subsequent work to bring it into translation he has been conducting basic translational and clinical studies devoted to understanding the pathophysiology and the genetic basis of the heterogeneity in sickle cell phenotypic presentation he is one who works across various disciplines and that's exemplified by his recent publication in new england journal of medicine where he has contributed to the crispr cas9 gene editing of bcl 11a erythroid uh, enhancer and this has achieved a persistent fetal hemoglobin expression and also a homogeneous distribution throughout the body an interesting part is that the two patients who actually participated in this trial they still have a good fetal hemoglobin level and their symptoms have also alleviated so what i try to cover is professor martin starts from basic science to an applied science and it's really exciting to have him on this series so professor martin i invite you for this talk which is titled fetal hemoglobin in sickle cell anemia bedside bench bedside and beyond professor martin please thank you very much for that introduction i'm very pleased to be here and uh, what i'm going to do today is to show you how uh, observations at the bedside by at the bedside by a pediatric hematologist led to a series of uh, laboratory studies that again brought us back to the bedside and actually uh, uh, treatment of patients and how we might move from uh, where we are now in the treatment of uh, sickle cell uh, disease patients. And uh, I'm uh, representing Boston University School of Medicine, our sickle cell center, uh, where we do uh, basic translational and clinical research in sickle cell disease, our center of regenerative medicine, that's been a leader in the field of use of induced pluripotent stem cells uh, to study disease mechanisms and the Boston Medical Center our uh, clinical unit so uh, i'm going to talk uh, a little bit about hemoglobin switching because i know that you've all heard this before how fetal hemoglobin uh, impacts the phenotype of uh, sickle cell disease the special role of uh, fetal hemoglobin in modulating certain complications of sickle cell disease the arab indian haplotype which uh, has as a feature high fetal hemoglobin levels and how 
uh, fetal hemoglobin levels might be increased in uh, Arab Indian haplotype patients. Uh, pharmacologic induction of fetal hemoglobin, which will turn out to be uh, the most effective way of treatment if sufficiently high levels of fetal hemoglobin can be induced in enough cells. Uh, the present state of the art in cell-based therapy to increase uh, fetal hemoglobin, especially concentrating on uh, genome editing. So first of all, what is fetal hemoglobin? Well, this is one of the uh, hemoglobin tetramers that are present in, uh, in virtually every uh, individual, expressed as uh, at high levels uh, during uh, uh, fetal life and rapidly declining uh, as the uh, individual matures. And it's characterized by the, uh, the gamma globin chain. All hemoglobin tetramers have alpha chains. Fetal hemoglobin is characterized by a gamma chain, normal adult hemoglobin by a beta chain, and sickle hemoglobin by a mutated beta chain. And the gamma globin chain differs from beta globin in 39 or 40 uh, amino acids. Uh, it's present in about 80, uh, at a level of about 80% in newborns, rapidly declines uh, beginning in the uh, third trimester of pregnancy, so that by the end of 12 months in normal individuals, there's less than 1% uh, fetal hemoglobin present. Uh, in sickle cell disease, fetal hemoglobin levels remain elevated compared with normal individuals. And uh, they don't stabilize to their permanent level until sometime between five or 10 years of uh, age. In, feet, in sickle uh, cell anemia patients of African descent, uh, the average fetal hemoglobin level in adults is somewhere between four and 10%. In individuals uh, of Arab or Indian descent who have the Arab Indian haplotype of the disease, fetal hemoglobin levels stabilize at about 10 years of age and uh, are somewhere between 16 and 23% uh, of, uh, of total hemoglobin. So this slide summarizes some of the early work uh, that uh, led uh, to uh, the point where we are now in time, and that is to induce very high levels of fetal hemoglobin. And perhaps the earliest work was uh, by a pediatrician in Brooklyn, New York, my hometown. Uh, and she noted that in infants uh, of uh, mothers with sickle cell trait, that when their cells were uh, deoxygenated, they sickled less than their mother cells, even though these infants had sickle cell anemia and the mothers only had sickle cell trait. And she attributed this uh, protection uh, to high levels of fetal hemoglobin in these cells. And she also noted that uh, infants with sickle cell uh, anemia uh, usually are asymptomatic until sometime later in the first year of life, coincidence with the uh, fall in uh, fetal hemoglobin levels. Uh, Bill Eaton and his co-workers showed that there was a late delay time between the deoxygenation of sickle hemoglobin uh, and the accumulation of polymer, and that this delay time was prolonged by uh, increased levels of uh, fetal hemoglobin. Uh, Aura Platt and uh, her associates showed that uh, the probability of survival was related to fetal hemoglobin levels, so that individuals who had fetal hemoglobins uh, less than uh, 8.6% had a shorter survival than individuals who had fetal hemoglobin levels of, of, above 8.6%. And it was the concentration of fetal hemoglobin in, uh, in the cells that was uh, important in uh, protecting the cells and maintaining flow. So that if about a third of hemoglobin in the cell was fetal hemoglobin, each cell has somewhere as about 30 picograms of fetal hemoglobin. When the cell was uh, deoxygenated, uh, it was protected uh, from uh, the ill effects of sickle hemoglobin polymerization and was able to make it through the microvasculature, the capillary uh, arterioles, the capillaries, and into the large uh, blood vessels without causing vasoocclusion. On the other hand, when there was far less fetal hemoglobin in the cell, less than six picograms, uh, when the cell was deoxygenated, it sickled uh, and occluded flow in the microvasculature, leading to uh, downstream uh, effects of uh, tissue hypoxia, inflammation, and uh, some of the phenotypes of sickle cell disease. So this uh, hemoglobin switching process is outlined on, uh, on this slide. Excuse me. 
Uh, so the uh, beta-like globin genes are in a cluster on chromosome 11. And uh, there's the epsilon globin gene, which is expressed in the embryo, but expression uh, rapidly uh, falls off, replaced by uh, a reciprocal increase in gamma globin gene uh, expression encoded by the linked fetal hemoglobin genes, G gamma and A gamma, the G and A standing for glycine or alanine at position 136 in the beta uh, in the gamma globin chain. Uh, so uh, gamma globin gene expression peaks midway uh, during gestation. Uh, and then uh, another reciprocal change, the uh, gamma globin uh, gene expression, sorry, uh, falls as uh, the adult beta globin gene uh, expression uh, increases. And the expression of these genes is modulated by a number of factors, including an upstream uh, super enhancer called the locus control region. The expression of the uh, gamma globin genes is modulated uh, by uh, two transacting elements and one cis acting element or quantitative trait loci. Uh, and these uh, were uh, discovered first by family studies and then verified by genome wide uh, association studies. And these uh, three uh, quantitative trait loci are BCL11A locus on the short arm of chromosome uh, two the MYB locus and the short arm of chromosome six, and the locus associated with the beta globin gene cluster on uh, chromosome 11. And this locus is marked by the well-known XMN1 uh, restriction in the nuclease site that's 158 base pairs five prime of the G gamma globin gene. And that is found in both the Senegal and in the Arab Indian haplotypes. And it's polymorphisms uh, in, uh, in the BCL11A gene MYB gene and at the uh, XMN1 restriction site that are strongly associated with uh, fetal hemoglobin levels and modulate the expression or are involved in the modulation of expression of the gamma globin gene. Now, I know uh, people who've attended this uh, series have heard in detail about hemoglobin switching from uh, Stuart Orkin. And I just wanted to uh, illustrate here uh, two factors that play critical roles in. Uh, fetal hemoglobin gene uh, repression. And that is BCL11A uh, and uh, ZBT7A. And they exert their effects, uh, as we'll see later, by binding to specific sequences uh, in the promoters of, uh, of both uh, gamma globin genes. And the levels of uh, expression of these genes and their proteins are uh, modulated by a number of co-repressor elements uh, abbreviated uh, here, uh, also by the gene KLF and, and uh, MYB, and also uh, by the super uh, enhancer, which uh, then loops and makes physical contact with the uh, different genes of the uh, beta globin gene-like uh, complex. So this is a very complicated uh, control mechanism, but it affords uh, a number of sites where uh, the the modulation of these genes uh, might be affected. And some of these uh, sites have been targeted in the current approaches to gene therapy as we'll discuss uh, later on in the talk. So the pathophysiology of sickle cell disease is complicated and uh, I won't be discussing this in detail today. I just wanted to highlight uh, the uh, first uh, facet of pathophysiology and that's sickle hemoglobin polymerization because fetal hemoglobin exerts its therapeutic effect by interfering with the polymerization process. So the single uh, mutation at uh, position uh, six or seven actually in the, uh, in the beta globin chain uh, causes a substitution of uh, glutamic acid for valine, which allows hemoglobin to uh, polymerize uh, when it's uh, deoxygenated. And it's fetal hemoglobin that interferes with this polymerization process. The process itself leads to the pathophysiologic features of the disease, the hemolysis or short-lived lifespan of the sickle cells and all the downstream effects of hemolysis, which we won't discuss today. And also the uh, deformation of the uh, sickle erythrocyte or sickling, which leads to uh, sickle uh, vaso uh, occlusion and the downstream complications of sickle Vaso occlusion. 
The polymerization process and its inhibition by fetal hemoglobin is nicely illustrated by this picture from an article by the Leighton and Frank Bunn uh, a number of years ago. And this shows the hemoglobin tetramer, the common alpha chain in blue, the sickle beta globin chain in red, and the fetal hemoglobin chain in, G in green. Now it turns out that either the mixed hybrid tetramer, that is uh, two alpha chains and a, a sickle chain and a fetal hemoglobin chain, or fetal hemoglobin itself cannot be uh, accommodated in the uh, physical structure of this uh, polymer. It's excluded from the polymer. Uh, therefore, decreasing uh, uh, the polymerization of uh, sickle hemoglobin. And this uh, shows a cell with fetal hemoglobin and, uh, and both uh, uh, asymmetric hybrids uh, like this and fetal hemoglobin. And it turns out uh, that uh, in studies a number of years ago by Ron Nagel and his collaborators, that the glutamine at uh, position 87 in the gamma globin chain is one of the two residues in this chain that uh, responsible for most of the anti-polymerization effects of fetal hemoglobin. And we'll see the importance of this uh, when it comes to uh, gene uh, therapy of sickle cell disease. So fetal hemoglobin is not in all cells. It's uh, at least at detectable levels. So uh, it's present in F cells and F cells are, are defined as uh, erythrocytes with hemoglobin F detectable by uh, fluorescent activating cell, uh, activated cell sorting where these cells are permeabilized and incubated with an antibody specific for fetal hemoglobin and then examined uh, by the uh, uh, fax uh, machine. F cells uh, contain both fetal hemoglobin and adult hemoglobin. And the adult hemoglobin can be normal hemoglobin in normal individuals and in individuals with sickle cell disease with sickle hemoglobin. And in sickle cell anemia, between two and 80% of red cells are F cells. Uh, now, Sickle F cells average about six picograms of, uh, of fetal hemoglobin per F cell. And this is the amount that takes for these cells to be detectable by facts. You need at least six picograms. If they have less, uh, they, they have fetal hemoglobin in them, but it's not uh, detectable by usual fax machines. However, fetal hemoglobin inhibits sickle hemoglobin polymerization almost entirely when its levels are about 10 picograms of hemoglobin F per F cell. So that uh, while six picograms probably helps uh, to get nearly total inhibition of sickle hemoglobin polymerization, you need about 10 picograms of fetal hemoglobin. And it turns out again, that uh, within and among individuals, this distribution of fetal hemoglobin within F cells uh, varies uh, greatly. So that even in individuals who have a similar total fetal hemoglobin concentration, the F is compartmentalized differently in their F cell populations. And this has a major importance in the pathophysiology of the disease. And here's some modeling that we did uh, a number of years ago. If I can get the slide to stay. And uh, what we did was uh, we chose uh, four different uh, fetal hemoglobin concentrations, reflective of the average level of fetal hemoglobin in uh, the common haplotypes of the disease. So 5% fetal hemoglobin, as in most patients of uh, African descent with Benin, Cameroon, or uh, Bantu haplotype, about 10% fetal hemoglobin reflecting individuals of African descent with Senegal haplotype, about 20% fetal hemoglobin affecting individuals with the Arab Indian haplotype and 30% uh, reflecting individuals with the Arab Indian haplotype who are children because children have much higher fetal hemoglobin levels uh, than adults. And we modeled the possible distributions of F concentrations in F cells so that everything to the right of the dash line is detectable as an F cell. And you could see that with 5% fetal hemoglobin, uh, you could have uh, very few or almost no detectable F cells. Uh, everything to the right of the solid line, uh, which denote, denotes uh, 10 micrograms of uh, fetal hemoglobin, reflects F cells that are nearly totally protected from fetal hemoglobin, uh, from sickle hemoglobin polymerization. 
And so it's not until you get to about 30% uh, fetal hemoglobin concentration that it's possible to have large numbers of F cells protected totally from polymerization. It's uh, almost impossible to have uh, a large number of cells protected when the fe fetal hemoglobin level is only 5%. In the Senegal haplotype, you could have some cells protected in the Saudi patients or Indian patients, the AI haplotype, one could have large number of protected cells. But these are just uh, three uh, examples for each fetal hemoglobin concentration of uh, almost an infinite number of uh, F cell distributions uh, among F cells. And what a patient happens to end up with in this F cell distribution probably plays an important role in determining the phenotype of their disease. And I've shown this uh, uh, perhaps a little uh, clearer in, in this slide, which shows the differential effects of fetal hemoglobin on the phenotypes of sickle cell disease. So uh, this is the uh, uh, panoply of uh, erythrocytes in the blood of an individual. One could have uh, F cells that are almost totally protected from uh, sickling because they have uh, sufficiently high fetal hemoglobin concentrations. One could have F cells that are partially protected. So these are cells that have somewhat less than 10 micrograms of that. Uh, the cells that have high uh, levels of uh, fetal hemoglobin levels won't sickle when deoxygenated. The low F cell, uh, the, the low F concentration cells will deform and form sickle cells. Also, cells that have low concentration of F uh, can uh, hemolyze. Uh, within the circulation and also extravascularly. And we've shown uh, in, in large numbers of studies now that uh, the vaso-occlusive and hemolytic phenotypes of the disease are associated with different levels, uh, sets of complications. So the sickle vasoocclusion occlusion is associated with pain, osteonecrosis, acute chest syndrome, and higher fetal hemoglobin levels decrease uh, the incidence of uh, these complications of the disease. And this is due to the uh, vaso-occlusion caused by the interaction of sickle cells with endothelial cells and other cells. On the other hand, the hemolytic uh, subphenotype of the disease is due to the hemolysis of cells with no fetal hemoglobin or with insufficient levels of fetal hemoglobin. Because it takes only a relatively small uh, amounts of uh, free heme in the plasma to uh, provoke this uh, vasculopathic uh, phenotype. Uh, and it does this by interfering uh, with uh, nitric oxide levels, scavenging uh, nitric oxide. And it turns out that the uh, subphenotypes of stroke, pulmonary hypertension, nephropathy, priapism, uh, leg ulcer are closely associated with this hemolytic phenotype. And the increase of fetal hemoglobin has very uh, little effect on the incidence of these, probably because it only takes a small number of unprotected cells uh, to induce uh, this uh, phenotype. And so the, uh, what this pathophysiology tells us is that it's important to induce as much fetal hemoglobin in as many red cells as possible to protect from both the uh, sickle vaso occlusion and hemolysis. And while it hasn't been possible to do this with the drug therapy uh, at the present time, as we'll see uh, later, it's possible to do this with cellular-based therapeutics. Now this slide shows the distribution of fetal hemoglobin, uh, of, of sickle hemoglobin haplotypes throughout the world. Uh, the, uh, uh, the largest number of patients uh, uh, being individuals uh, with the uh, Benin, Bantu Cameroon haplotypes who have fetal hemoglobin levels of five to six percent, a smaller number of patients with the Senegal haplotype that has uh, uh, fetal hemoglobin levels of about 10 percent. The spread of these uh, haplotypes uh, throughout the uh, world by, uh, by slave trading and population migrations. And then the uh, Arab Indian haplotype, uh, which is associated with uh, the highest fetal hemoglobin level. So these uh, figures are taken from a recent paper by uh, Amin al-Ali uh, 
uh, and, and his colleagues in Saudi Arabia, where we examined uh, more than 600 Saudi AI haplotype homozygotes. These are all adults. They had fetal hemoglobin levels of about 16%. They had uh, complications of the disease. Most of them had pain, uh, 30, 40%. Uh, uh, had acute chest syndrome and osteonecrosis, and about 20% had uh, uh, cerebrovascular disease. So in, uh, in adults, uh, this uh, incidence is not all that different from incident, uh, incidence of these complications in uh, African populations. So the benign nature of Arab Indian haplotype disease really came from uh, the examination of children with the disease many years ago by Richard Perrine and his associates. So when you look at long, young children, their fetal hemoglobin levels were 30% or more, and they had relatively benign disease. But with aging, as fetal hemoglobin levels fell and stabilized, the phenotype of this disease became more severe. Now the phenotype uh, of the disease became severe, the fetal hemoglobin levels fell, but the fetal hemoglobin levels were also impacted by polymorphisms of uh, one of the uh, major transacting elements, BCL11A, uh, so that uh, if one had the, uh, uh, the alternate allele uh, of uh, one of the SNPs in BCL11A, fetal hemoglobin levels were near 20%. If one lacked uh, this allele, the all wild type, fetal hemoglobin levels were 15%. So even though the baseline level is probably set by the cis-acting elements here, transacting elements played a role in modulation of, uh, of fetal hemoglobin in the Arab Indian haplotype. And we were interested in trying to understand uh, what might account for the high fetal hemoglobin level in uh, AI haplotype uh, homozygotes. So we examined uh, patients with, uh, of Saudi descent uh, with the uh, Arab Indian haplotype, patients of Indian descent with the Arab Indian haplotype, uh, African Americans uh, who had uh, the uh, usual run of, uh, uh, of African derived haplotypes. And it turns out that based on whole genome sequencing studies and replication in nearly a thousand patients with the uh, Arab Indian haplotype, that SNPs in a gene uh, ANTXR1, uh, an anthrax receptor gene, uh, were uh, associated with uh, fetal hemoglobin levels. So these uh, show the uh, homozygous wild type, the heterozygous, and the homozygous uh, mutant allele in uh, Saudi uh, patients with, uh, uh, with the AI haplotype. And uh, the patients who were homozygous for the mutant allele, uh, fetal hemoglobin was uh, significantly higher than uh, in uh, patients who had uh, the uh, wild type allele and the heterozygous or intermediate. There was no change in individuals with uh, African haplotypes. And we examined relatively small numbers of patients with the Indian uh, patient, patients of Indian origin with the AI haplotype, and there was there was also no change in in them. However, this uh, you know whether this is present in Indians, I think requires the uh, a larger number of patients to see. We looked at the uh, expression of, uh, of 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 these genes by RNA sequencing, and in CD thirty four cells, as they matured and fetal hemoglobin levels fell the expression of uh, ANTXR1 uh, increased. In induced pluripotent stem cells where fetal hemoglobin levels rise with maturation, the expression of these, uh, this gene fell, suggesting that this was uh, a hemoglobin, uh, uh, fetal hemoglobin gene repressor as is BCL11A and MYB. And then when we looked in sickle IPS cells at the expression of, uh, again, uh, of, of anthrax as these cells uh, matured and fetal hemoglobin levels uh, increased, expression fell off uh, as uh, the fetal hemoglobin levels uh, increased. So this is a possible transacting factor that might modulate fetal hemoglobin uh, in, uh, in AI haplotype homozygous, at least of, uh, of, of Saudi origin. The other possible modulator in, uh, of the AI haplotype is a subhaplotype of uh, uh, in, in the uh, HBG2 uh, olfactory receptor uh, region. And so the extensive uh, analysis showed that 
uh, subhaplotype consisting of these three uh, SNPs in uh, critical areas of the gene in around hypersensitive side two of the locus control region. Uh, and uh, th these sites were also uh, heavily uh, uh, marked by uh, the uh, acetylated uh, lysine uh, 27, a mark of expressed genes. Uh, DNA hypersensitivity and transcription factor binding. So that there was this haplotype uh, that was so specific in the AI haplotype that might play some role in the cis regulatory uh, increased expression of, uh, of fetal uh, globin genes. This led to a hypothesis uh, about the cis-acting modulation of fetal hemoglobin in the different haplotypes of the disease. In the Arab Indian haplotype, one has, uh, has this spe uh, specific sub-haplotype that favored the looping of the locus control region and associated uh, transcription factors to the promoters of the gamma globin gene. In the uh, African haplotype regulate, uh, represented by Benin that had uh, only a single one of these uh, polymorphisms in the locus control region and not the cis-acting uh, uh, polymorphism, there was preferential looping of the locus control region and its associated elements to the adult globin gene. Whereas in the Senegal haplotype where fetal hemoglobin levels were intermediate between the Arab Indian and Benin haplotype, uh, there was the presence of the cis-acting uh, SNP5 prime to the G gamma gene and one of the SNPs in the locus control region so that there was a intermediate interaction between the locus control region and uh, the uh, gamma globin genes. I think there's a lot of uh, work that remains to be done to try to define the uh, actual reasons why the uh, Arab Indian haplotype is associated with much higher fetal hemoglobin levels than other haplotypes. But these are some of the uh, results uh, that suggest that there might be additional uh, genetic regulation uh, responsible for the high fetal hemoglobin levels in these individuals. So I wanted to uh, transition now to a little uh, bit about drug therapy uh, to induce high fetal hemoglobin. And we have a drug that's cheap, uh, relatively speaking, that uh, is capable of inducing increased fetal hemoglobin level in most patients who receive the drug especially when they receive it at a very young age, uh, and is associated with uh, a clinically important reduction in uh, morbidity and mortality, and that's hydroxyurea. And the work of a number of investigators uh, have now suggested that standard of care should be starting hydroxyurea at six to 12 months of, of age. And as I'll show you, by doing this, it's possible to maintain at least for a while, uh, higher fetal hemoglobin levels and uh, prevent the uh, complications of the disease uh, becoming clinically manifest. Now, hydroxyurea in adults and children associated with decreased pain, acute chest syndrome. It's associated with reduction in mortality. Uh, this, uh, th these effects on phenotypes is associated with reduced hospitalization and costs. The hemoglobin goes up, so hydroxyurea both decreases hemolysis and vasoocclusion. The number of transfusions uh, used uh, decreases. And for optimal effects, it's likely that this drug should be uh, titrated to maximum uh, effective doses. And this has been shown both in, uh, in developed uh, countries like US, France, and England, but also now studies in Africa show that it's possible to uh, titrate uh, hydroxyurea and get uh, optimal uh, effects. You monitor this simply by looking at the CBC for cytopenias and uh, fetal hemoglobin for uh, efficacy. Now, this is uh, what I think is important work by uh, McGann and his coworkers in Cincinnati. And I've shown in this table a comparison of the baby hydroxyurea trial, or which led to the use of hydroxyurea in very young children. And uh, the PK or pharmacokinetic guided approach to dosing uh, that, uh, that these uh, investigators use. So here are the age of patients treated in months, the dose used, and you can see the hydroxyurea uh, baby hug trial used about 20 milligrams per kilogram. The PK guided therapy used a much higher dose. Uh, 
uh, the fetal hemoglobin levels uh, increased in the PK guided treatments where they fell in the baby hug uh, uh, patients. The hemoglobin increased in the baby uh, hug study a little bit, but much more in the PK guided uh, study. There was uh, a stabilization of the uh, of leukocyte count, the uh, neutrophil count. But importantly, uh, while uh, patients in the baby hug trial continued to have episodes of hand foot syndrome or dactylitis, and they continued to have uh, vaso episodes, these were nearly totally eliminated when uh, this drug was used at maximum tolerated doses. So uh, this presents uh, a bit of a conundrum, I think, for the pediatricians. I mean, we know that uh, hydroxyurea, which has been used in adults for more than 30 years now, is uh, safe and, uh, and can be effective, uh, although its effects are far from optimum. On the other hand, we know that uh, in, in very young children, one could uh, induce disease-changing increases in, hydroxy, uh, in, in fetal hemoglobin. What we don't know is how long these changes are going to last because these uh, children have been followed for very few years and how safe this is going to be in these very young children, how this is going to affect their re reproductive uh, possibilities because of the association of azospermia with uh, hydroxyurea. So I think the pediatricians have their work cut out for them. It's going to take many years of following these to see if this therapy, which is uh, efficacious and even effective in uh, very young children, uh, remains uh, the same uh, in adults, because this is a drug that has to be taken for life. Now, it's possible to induce uh, fetal hemoglobin with other drugs, and I just listed a few of them here. One could uh, interfere with the lysine uh, specific demethylase uh, uh, pathway and the drugs that do this, although they've been beset with some uh, complications. There are clinical trials going on of the phosphodiesterase 9 inhibitors, which uh, lead to increased levels of cyclic GMP, which uh, promote uh, fetal hemoglobin uh, uh, synthesis. There are trials, uh, I think, with the beginning of polychrome repressive complex uh, inhibitors, which play a role in uh, expression of gamma globin genes. The histone deacetylase inhibitors have been uh, tried with uh, varying effects. And there are other drugs that, by different mechanisms, affect uh, erythroid maturation and fetal hemoglobin production. So, the critical uh, thing for inducing fetal hemoglobin is to find a small molecule. Uh, that's orally available that can induce very high levels of fetal hemoglobin in, in, uh, in, in most red cells. And this will be the most effective way of managing uh, uh, sickle cell disease by a fetal hemoglobin related mechanism. We're not there yet, but I think there's a lot of work uh, that's going on to develop uh, oral agents. So this brings me to uh, cellular based treatment uh, to induce uh, uh, anti-polymerization or increased fetal hemoglobin in uh, sickle cell disease and in beta thalassemia because fetal hemoglobin uh, uh, induction to high levels is also uh, a, a perfectly useful treatment for beta thalassemia. It increases hemoglobin, there's no polymerization in thalassemia, but fetal hemoglobin is a decent oxygen delivery molecule. So enough fetal hemoglobin will cure uh, thalassemia as well as uh, sickle cell disease. So all cellular-based gene therapies use this approach. The patients are screened, the stem cells are collected in sickle cell disease. We only are able to use uh, fluorexifor. Can't use GCSF because of the toxic effects of this drug in sickle cell anemia. So stem cells are collected uh, after screening and sent to a central manufacturing facility, which isolates the hematopoietic stem of the cells, the CD34 cells, and uh, then this facility either edits these cells with a CRISPR-Cas construct or in, uh, transduces these cells with a lenti viral vector that contains the gene, uh, uh, therapeutic gene. The cells are, are, go through extensive quality controls, they're frozen, and then they're returned to the patient's clinical center. And the patients then are conditioned to receive the cells. First of all, they're, uh, transfused heavily, usually with exchange transfusion for a couple of months to turn off endogenous hematopoiesis and calm the bone marrow down uh, because it's uh, been shown 
that uh, this helps the engraftment of the transfused cells. Then they are conditioned with a, a, a genotoxic agent, now busulfan or a relative of busulfan, uh, so that the patient's uh, uh, bone marrow is, uh, is destroyed. And the niche in the bone marrow is, uh, is made available for the uh, cells which are reinfused. And these reinfused cells either contain the uh, CRISPR-Cas uh, complex here, abbreviated CTX001, or the lentiviral. They're infused in the patients uh, uh, for two or three or four weeks, is, five weeks is need, needed for engraftment and hematopoietic recovery, in which time the patients are at risk for a number of factors like infection or bleeding. Uh, when they go through this period, uh, then in the hospital, they're discharged and follow up and monitored for engraftment and hematopoietic recovery, adverse events, hemoglobin production, hemolysis, hemoglobin F, uh, and the clinical symptoms. And uh, so that all of the, I took this slide from the ASH presentation of Heda Fangul, uh, but the same approach to uh, gene therapy uh, is, is used in uh, in, in all cell-based approaches at the present time. So here are the results of the lentiviral mediated gene therapy where fetal hemoglobin is, isn't induced, but a, a hemoglobin F-like hemoglobin A is, uh, is used. And this uh, F-like hemoglobin A contains the, uh, the beta uh, 87 uh, uh, TQ uh, change uh, that I mentioned previously. So it has this single amino acid uh, change which inhibits polymerization and makes it like fetal hemoglobin. And there've been more patients studied uh, than I've, uh, I've shown here, but you could see that over time, uh, the uh, concentration of the variant hemoglobin increases to more than uh, 50% or about 50% in a larger number of patients. And associated with this increase in fetal hemoglobin is the predicted fall of hemolysis measured by LDH, fall in reticulocyte counts, fall in bilirubin. And the patients uh, have not been described to have sickle basal occlusion or acute chest syndrome. So the results were highly encouraging until three days ago when uh, it was reported by Bluebird uh, Bio, the uh, sponsor of these trials, that two patients uh, developed myeloid malignancies. One had a myeloid dysplastic syndrome, the other had acute myeloid leukemia. And actually there was a second MDS patient reported a number of years ago. Uh, the cause of this isn't known. Whether this is uh, insertional mutagenesis due, due to the lentivirus, whether this is an effect of uh, the busulfan conditioning, whether this is the uncovering of a previously present uh, mutation, is not clear. The uh, leukemic cells did have the uh, viral vector in them, but whether this was responsible for leukemogenesis or not isn't known yet. But the trials were stopped. Uh, the medicine was pulled from the market where it's approved in Europe for treating some types of thalassemia. And uh, it's going to be a, a number of weeks or months before we know exactly uh, uh, why uh, these myeloid malignancies were induced by lentiviral vector. So it was a major setback uh, for the field. Now, I mentioned before BCL11A, a major repressor of, uh, of fetal hemoglobin uh, gene expression. And uh, the uh, BCL11A is an important transacting regulator, was studied. Uh, in, uh, in urine sickle cell disease, transgenic animals with sickle cell anemia by uh, Stu Orkin and his associates uh, uh, almost 10, 10 years ago uh, now in their beginning studies. And these slides show the red blood cells in control uh, uh, mice without the sickle uh, cell uh, uh, transgene. Very little uh, of, of fetal hemoglobin uh, present. In sickle cell mice, uh, when the BCL11A was uh, knocked out uh, or uh, ZBT7A was, uh, was knocked out, there was a marked increase in, uh, in, in fetal hemoglobin, about 70%. In sickle mice, we had uh, a knockout of, uh, of both uh, BCL11A and 
for CBTP7A, the smears started to resemble that in normals, and there was over 90% uh, fetal hemoglobin. So this work was the preclinical study suggesting that if we could interfere with BCL BCL11A expression in humans, uh, there might be a, a therapeutic gain. So there are other ways, uh, th th there are a number of ways of, of doing this. And so uh, these are some approaches to genome editing to cure beta hemoglobinopathies. Uh, Dan Bauer and Stu Hawkins' uh, lab showed a number of years ago that uh, there was an erythroid specific enhancer for BCL11A located in the second intron of this gene. And these were the sites, important critical sites for the enhancer. And if one of these sites uh, could be disrupted, uh, then fetal hemoglobin levels could be uh, markedly increased. It was also possible uh, to not to increase with the expression of the gene, but to uh, uh, alter the uh, interaction of the protein with the uh, with, with binding sites and the promoters of the glomerulin gene. So we know uh, that there's specific binding domain the BCL11A in about position minus 156, uh, 115 in the promoters of both gamma globin genes and an important binding site for uh, ZBTB7A, uh, 200 base pairs uh, upstream of the promoters. And so that interference with these sites could again relieve repression of uh, gamma globin genes. And it's also possible to uh, directly repair the uh, sickle hemoglobin mutation by using the reparative mechanism of homologous uh, homology directed repair However, this is much less efficient than uh, the use of, uh, of this non-homologous end journey mechanism of DNA repair uh, of the double-stranded breaks uh, that are introduced uh, and leads to the production of insertion deletion of mutations that disrupt uh, either the enhancer or uh, the binding sites uh, for, uh, for the uh, in these uh, transcription factors. So the BCL11A enhancer was targeted uh, in uh, the uh, erythroid stem cells that were isolated, as I showed before, using a specific guide RNA that targeted this uh, enhancer and that uh, uh, abrogated the expression of the uh, BCL11A gene. And here are the uh, clinical results presented by uh, Fangul at the uh, ASH meeting in the first three uh, patients with uh, sickle cell disease. I think there've been four patients treated now. I think there are more than 10 patients with thalassemia and the results are consistent. Now, let me emphasize that this uh, construct, the CRISPR-Cas construct is not introduced by a lentiviral vector, but is introduced by electroporacin or shocking the uh, uh, the uh, hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells with the pulse of electricity that allows the construct to enter the cells, then the membrane is repaired, and the cells go on and, and have what seems to be a, a happy uh, post electroporation life. And so, we've shown over time, and now this is out to about two years actually, uh, the uh, levels of, uh, of, of fetal hemoglobin, which are about 40% uh, or so and the, uh, the level of sickle hemoglobin is about uh, 50%. So that they're very high levels of fetal hemoglobin. And uh, this shows the, uh, the following infusion, the uh, F cell levels, and virtually all of these cells are F cells and because the concentration of fetal hemoglobin is so high, uh, they have uh, very high levels of uh, F per F cell although it hasn't been measured directly, but it's probably you know, considerably over 10 picograms. And this is reflected in the uh, clinical evaluation of these patients. So uh, this shows uh, the uh, uh, follow-up uh, period, pre-study vaso-occlusive uh, complications here is a, a seven for two years, seven and a half, four. Since uh, the study, there've been no vaso-occlusive episodes in any of these patients. All patients have uh, uh, had an increase in hemoglobin to about uh, 12, uh, 13 uh, grams uh, or so. And this increased hemoglobin is because not that they were transfused, they've been transfusion-free since uh, infusion of the product, 
but they have a reduction in hemolysis. So they have now detectable haptoglobin, the LDH has fallen, and there's no evidence of, uh, of, uh, of, of hemolytic anemia. So this is a, uh, you know, a, a remarkable result. I emphasize that there are very few patients treated. They've been followed for a very short period of time. This is a highly technologically involved uh, uh, approach to inducing uh, fetal hemoglobin. But uh, the results in the short term are highly promising. Now, this is a, a, a third way that's been clinically tested uh, to uh, target the erythroid enhancer of BCL11A to increase fetal hemoglobin. This is work from Dave Williams' lab, which was presented uh, on the same issue of the New England Journal uh, as our work using CRISPR and Cas. And they use a short half in RNA. Uh, directed to the erythroid enhancer BCL11A for specificity in erythroid cells. This uh, uh, hairpin was introduced with a lentiviral vector uh, similar uh, to the one that was used in the uh, lentiglobin trial that I talked about earlier. So that is, is something to, uh, to consider uh, now given the association of uh, leukemia uh, in the uh, lentiglobin trial, although uh, its mechanisms uh, and the importance of this, we certainly don't know at this time. This effect, th this approach to inducing fetal hemoglobin is also highly uh, effective. So that uh, F cells increase to 80% uh, uh, or more, the F per F cell was uh, high, uh, the hemoglobin went up, the uh, absolute particular side count fell, lactic uh, dehydrogenase fell, and importantly, uh, these patients were also symptom-free. So it turns out that all of these gene therapy approaches really have pretty similar end results in terms of fetal hemoglobin and clinical complications. They all have close to half of their hemoglobin, either fetal hemoglobin or some uh, non-sickling uh, or polymerization inhibiting type of hemoglobin in them. They all have been associated with virtual absence of, uh, of uh, both uh, vaso-occlusive complications and considerable reduction, if not absence of, uh, of uh, the hemolytic related complications of the disease. Uh, the path to their uh, excellent uh, effects is similarly difficult for all of them. So that the, uh, they have to have their cells collected, which is not always easy in the sickle cell patients, especially uh, in adults. Uh, they have to be conditioned with myotoxic conditioning, which is very difficult. But once uh, they go through this and they graph, the results seem to be similarly good. It's going to take a long time to find out uh, which of these approaches is best. And I think it's going to take a longer time now with the association of, uh, of myeloid, uh, myeloid neoplasia in uh, the first uh, gene therapy trials with lentiglobin. So there are other ways of, uh, of interfering with uh, the sequence of, uh, of, of critical uh, elements that affect uh, uh, globin gene expression. Uh, this is a base editing where it's possible to, uh, to, to edit the genome without inducing the double-stranded breaks that CRISPR-Cas does. And here one uses a, a dead Cas enzyme or some other variant that just nicks the DNA, allows the introduction of this uh, guide RNA uh, that is, uh, is targeting the sequence uh, of, of interest. And tethered to this is a cytidine deaminase, which is possible then uh, to deaminate the target C to a, uh, to, to a uridine a residue, which is then recognized as, uh, as a T. And it's possible also to there are also adenine uh, base uh, edits. So here you could uh, with, you can do precision editing without double-stranded breaks and with uh, th th that uh, aren't repaired by uh, mechanisms like uh, uh, non-homologous uh, end joining. Now, as a proof of, uh, of principle, uh, Kim Van Atzel in, uh, in our Center for Regenerative Medicine uh, used the uh, HUDEP uh, uh, two cell line, which is uh, 
uh, which synthesizes uh, adult hemoglobin uh, usually. And she edited this XMN1 uh, recognition site, five prime to the uh, gamma globin uh, genes, the HB, uh, HBG uh, gene. And uh, she was uh, able to show uh, using the C to D base editing in three separate lines that now these uh, lines, which formerly synthesized hemoglobin A, uh, now go on and synthesize uh, large amounts yeah, of hemoglobin A. Still, uh, uh, approach to uh, fetal hemoglobin reduction that I'm, I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll see a lot more in the future. So in summary, uh, hydroxyurea, other drugs, cellular therapeutics are capable of inducing increased uh, fetal hemoglobin of uh, levels that are, are clinically significant mm -hmm. by decreasing the amount of uh, sickle hemoglobin polymer. The reduced polymer leads to a reduction in acute basal occlusion uh, and the complications associated with basal occlusion like osteoporosis and pain, also a reduction in mortality. In addition, high fetal hemoglobin in enough cells can prevent the intravascular hemolysis that's closely associated with sickle vasculopathy. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's features of nephropathy, CNS disease, priapism, and malagosis, and mortality. So that uh, at the moment, uh, th there's great attention being focused on different means of increasing fetal hemoglobin as it's a natural approach to infect, affecting the pathophysiology of the disease at an upstream uh, point uh, in the uh, pathophysiological cascade, preventing all of the downstream consequences like uh, inflammation uh, that uh, are associated with the many subphenotypes of the disease. So I tried to take you through the early uh, work on fetal hemoglobin, uh, leading us to the current effects of gene therapy. And uh, the work that I presented uh, from our group wouldn't have been possible without uh, uh, our graduate students uh, listed uh, here, my uh, colleagues in the genetics work, uh, Paolo Sebastiani, Clint Baldwin, Dave Chewy, John Farrell, uh, Saudi collaborators, uh, Abdul Al Sultan, Amin Al Ali, and our uh, collaborators, George Murphy, and Kim, and Gustavo in our Center for Regenerative Medicine. And of course, the uh, NIH, which supported uh, most of this work by research grants and training grants, and also the University of the Mom in Saudi Arabia. So I, I thank you. I think my time is uh, about up and I'll be uh, glad to uh, answer any questions if there are any, or if that's possible. Well, thanks a lot, Professor Martin. Uh, it was a fantastic talk and just starting from very basics of understanding the sickle cell phenotypic heterogeneity to understanding the role of fetal hemoglobin and then really working out various ways by which the fetal hemoglobin can be increased to alleviate the, uh, the disease severity. And you haven't just left there, but gone on to work with CRISPR-Cas gene editing. And uh, I must say this has been really a journey from very basic science to a translational science. Thanks again, uh, Professor Martin. So, uh, I, I hope you don't mind answering a few questions which are coming up on the chat box. Sure. Okay. So I'll, I'll read out the question for your benefit and then you can respond. So uh, first question comes that between the hemoglobin gene, fetal gene correction and fetal hemoglobin induction, which in your opinion is the most promising approach? Well, if it were possible to efficiently correct the sickle hemoglobin mutation in most cells, I would, uh, I, I think this is a better approach because then, of course, this, this is the primary cause of the disease. So if you could efficiently do that in most cells, I would prefer this approach. But at this moment in time, I don't think it's possible to do. I know there are some studies that are now uh, approaching this by, uh, uh, by different methods. Inducing fetal hemoglobin, I think, is the best second option because we know from natural examples like uh, sickle hereditary persistence of fetal hemoglobin that if you have 30% F in most cells, you have virtually no disease. However, 
there are always questions about uh, are there possibly some combinations, even, uh, complications, even with very high levels of fetal hemoglobin. So, I, you know, I think this is a very close second, and it's the most practical <laughs> way now. But in the future, uh, yep. if it's possible to correct mutation, I would prefer that. Yep. Okay. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> So while other questions are cropping up, I, I am taking privilege of, you know, being the moderator to ask a question. So <laughs> you, you showed, you know, very elegantly that uh, it's the fetal hemoglobin in the, uh, as a part of our Arab Indian haplotype uh, that is alleviating the disease phenotype. Now that essentially means that uh, those who are carrying this haplotype have a higher fetal hemoglobin levels like in India. And uh, so what is the need for hydroxyurea treatment for the people who are having Arab Indian haplotype? Oh, I think it's very important because as I uh, mentioned, these people aren't well. They have high fetal hemoglobin levels, but they have different distributions of F and SLs. And, and many of these people uh, have very severe disease. I mean, I, I, I've, I've, I've seen patients in Saudi Arabia, uh, you know, high fetal hemoglobin levels have a severe disease. And we know that from epidemiologic studies. We also know that hydroxyurea is, does induce higher fetal hemoglobin levels in these patients who already start with a high fetal hemoglobin. Mm -hmm. So you can't, you can't have too much fetal hemoglobin in, uh, in red cells. I mean, he, th there are, you know, some people have wondered about this, but there are people who have 100% fetal hemoglobin in cells or homozygous for the HPFH. And, and mm -hmm. these people are fine. I mean, they become pregnant, they could have children, they are asymptomatic. So the more, the better. And so I wouldn't withhold hydroxyurea <laughs> from a patient with uh, the Arab Indian haplotype, unless they happen to be that exceptional individual who maintains really high levels of fetal hemoglobin and has mm -hmm. little evidence of hemolysis or basal occlusion. Right, right, right. Yeah, because I mean, I'm coming from Indian perspective. I have heard from many clinicians that they don't, don't need, the, need the dose more than 10 milligram per kg. Whereas I remember that uh, elsewhere, they start with 30 milligram and then go on to 50 to 60 milligram per kg as the maximum tolerable day, dose. So, well, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, you, you uh, when, when you use hydroxyurea, you, you titrate the dose. You, you give <laughs> as much as you can to get the desired effect. Now, there's some people who can't yeah. tolerate higher doses. And there's some people who maybe even with 10 or 15 milligrams per kilogram yeah. will have really high fetal hemoglobin levels. And so that's fine. There are other people, you know, you use our top dose, about 35 milligrams per kilogram. And... Mm -hmm. uh, some who don't even respond to that. So the, the response yep. is very heterogeneous. Yeah, okay. So I'll go back to the question. One question has come from uh, Garima Thakur. Okay, so the question is that from evolution point of view, why do you think there are two repressors for gamma globin, BCL11A and ZBTB8? And is it possible to mutate the ZBTB8 binding site to induce fetal hemoglobin? Well, yeah, it, it, it's possible to do that. And I think, you know, that's been shown in, in, in vitro uh, already. And I don't know, there may be actual clinical studies on this. So the, the, the control of gamma gene expression, which uh, Stu Orkin knows a lot better than I do, is, uh, is redundant with many different uh, interacting uh, elements. And, and so I, I don't know, what, I, I'm sure there are more than two. There's actually a third repressor, uh, which we don't know the nature of, that's associated uh -huh. mainly with the G gamma gene. This is the one that, this is the transcription factor that's likely to bind the uh, minus 158 region. So mm -hmm. there are multiple overlapping and redundant uh, ways of uh, modulating gamma globin gene expression. Okay, thanks a lot. I had, uh, you know, <clears throat> one more question. Uh, when you talk about this, uh, you know, the F cells and the percentage of fetal hemoglobin, do you think that hydroxyurea treatment influences that as well? Well, well it, it influences, uh, you know, it influences F per uh, 
F cell. So hydroxyurea did, you know, hydroxyurea works not by a uh, transcriptional mechanism, but it probably works by uh, interfering with erythropoiesis, the, uh, mm -hmm. with the development of red cells. And so uh, the hydroxyurea works uh, uh, and, and increases uh, <clears throat> and alters both the, uh, the distribution, you know, the, the F uh, per F cell, as well as the total mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so the last question from my side. Uh, uh, there is so much of GWAS that has happened, you know. I, I remember when this uh, a, this mutation was identified as a part of Arab Indian haplotype, it was said that story is done. But now we know at least 40, 50 genes which are influencing fetal hemoglobin levels. But yet, they only explain about 20-25% of the heritability. So what do you think is the next step? I mean, where can we, you know, find that missing heritability, which can, you know, explain and help the patients? Well, you know, the missing uh, heritability probably comes from many rare variants. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, it, it requires uh, a very large scale whole genome sequencing to be able to pick out mm -hmm. these variants in the population because, you know, because of the statistics involved in, in doing this uh, sort of work. I think on the other hand, we know uh, due to the work of uh, Orkin's group, we know an awful lot about hemoglobin switching. And mm -hmm. we really know that, uh, you know, just a couple of genes, uh, uh, especially BCL11A and ZBTB7A, you know, if you could knock out uh, these genes in an erythroid specific manner, you could have a therapeutically important effect on, uh, on fetal hemoglobin. So it, it would be nice uh, yeah. to know what many rare variants are. I, I think, you know, the, the anthrax uh, receptor gene is, uh, you know, in, in the Saudi population, an example of a, hmm. perhaps an example of a variant limited to one population. And there's certainly lots of other ones that we just, uh, don't know. Right, right, right. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, Professor Martin. I think I can continue discussing with you, you know, whole morning of yours or whole night of mine, but I think you are tired also because of the other issues. So again, a big thanks to you for, you know, uh, joining and delivering a beautiful talk. Just for your information, close to 125 people attended this talk online. And uh, as Dr. Shiva mentioned that this talk will be available on YouTube, uh, which also we can follow and update you how many people are clicking on that. So thanks well, again, thanks. have a good day. And uh, I pass it on to Dr. Shiva for his final comments. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chandak uh, for sharing the session. Thank you, Professor uh, Steenberg uh, for giving a, a very interesting talk about on fetal hemoglobin regulation and the clinical translation. Thank you so much once again uh, for both of you. Thank you. Bye. That was a pleasure. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Bye. 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 Thanks, Shiva. Thank you.